Good afternoon and welcome to today's caregiver panel conversation, Program Models for Loved Ones Living with Dementia. My name is Allegra Jaffe and I am a social service specialist with the Fairfax Area Agency on Aging. A few housekeeping items before we begin today's session. Today's presentation is being recorded and a link for the recording will be sent to all registrants a week from today, as well as the slides from the organization. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please use the Q&A button um, where we have, um, we will have a Q&A session with the panelists towards the end of our hour. Uh, we also have enabled closed captioning. So if you need it, please let me know. Um, actually, I'm sorry, if you need it, just go on the bottom of your Zoom panel and you can enable closed captioning that way. And lastly, at the end of the presentation, there will be a quick survey. So please take a moment to fill out those questions for us. Uh, dementia is one of the most challenging age-related illnesses for family caregivers. Caregivers must cope with seeing their loved ones struggle with communication, memory loss, altered personalities, unusual behaviors, and loss of independence to care for oneself. Caregivers can burn out and experience greater health problems themselves, such as physical and emotional burden, as well as financial strains from loss of time at work or for paying for services. According to the Alzheimer's Association, an estimated 6.7 million Americans over age 65 are living with Alzheimer's dementia in 2023. About one in nine over age 65 have Alzheimer's dementia. One in three seniors uh, will die with Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. And nearly half of all caregivers who provide help to older adults do for someone with Alzheimer's or another dementia. Family caregivers need uh, support and relief to increase their ability to meet the needs of the person who's living with dementia uh, for, on a day-to-day -day basis, and they need to provide care for themselves. Through this conversation, let's explore program models that supports the caregiver and the person living with dementia. I want to introduce to you the panelists that will be joining me today. Uh, that would be Dr. Marjorie Burris from the Adult Day Healthcare Center Program Manager uh, with Fairfax County Neighborhood and Community Services, Marcy Campbell, Vice President of Marketing and Intake from Cherry Blossom Pace, Melissa Long uh, is the Director of Education and Support with Insight Memory Care Center, and Liara Raskis is with the RAF Dementia Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Northern Virginia RAF Program. And so I'm gonna go ahead and start with Marjorie. If you could please come and join me on camera and unmute and share a little bit about yourself and your organization. Good afternoon, Allegra. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Dr. Marjorie Burris, and I am one of the program managers for the Fairfax County Adult Day Health Center. So Fairfax County has four centers, one location, uh, location Lincolnia, Herndon, and Mount Vernon. Each center can hold up to 24 to 36 participants per day. We're open Monday through Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., and each center has licensed nurse recreational therapists, and program assistants to provide recreational needs for our participants. Our adult daycare is a planned program of activities in a professional care setting designed for older adults who require supervised care during the day or those who are isolated and lonely. Our ADHC enables seniors to socialize and enjoy planned activities in a group setting while receiving or needing health services. At the same time, they offer family caregivers respite from caregiving duties while knowing where their loved ones are. We enable adults with dementia due to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or a vascular issue, as well as those who, phys who have physical impairments or intellectual disability to live their best life at home with their family. 
Through focusing on the whole person, the intellectual, physical, and social needs, we create an individualized experience that gives participants new tools to thrive in life. Our activities and games engage critical thinking and promote memory care while fostering social interaction at the same time. We thrive ourselves in promoting mobility, balance, and strength through our exercise and fall prevention program. Recreational activities, our, rec our recreational activities provide 30 minute activities every 30 minutes, excuse me. Um, activity, both mental and physical, is a basic human need. Unfortunately, people with dementia have a very low rate of of activity participation because they often lack physical and cognitive abilities to initiate engagement. The boredom and isolation that results from inactivity lead to many of the behavioral symptoms exhibited by people with dementia. While the individual with dementia has a progressive disorder, that may limit his or her ability to participate in certain activities that does not mean that those activities cannot be modified to meet the abilities of the individual. Often, activities can be simplified just by breaking them down in steps and eliminating or modifying steps that are too difficult. Our therapeutic recreational specialists use appropriately adapted recreational and leisure time interventions to facilitate the development of an active lifestyle for people with dementia. Our 30 minute recreational activities should meet not only the interest of each individual, but also that person's specific needs for movement, stimulation, relaxation, and social experience. What are the benefits of attending Adult Day Health Center? Our benefit is to provide time for our caregivers at home, while their loved ones are with our centers, are with, within our centers receiving um, visits from therapy anim, animal, a karaoke party, a card game, volleyball game, or any dozen of activities. Um, concurrent activities ensure there is something for everyone to enjoy throughout the day. Our, our staff is staff, we are staffed with eight to 10 employees at each center. And um, we are open and we are accepting participants as, a, as soon as we are able to receive them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Um, if I can have, um, let's see, Marcy join us now um, from Cherry Blossom Pace. And Marjorie, you can uh, go ahead and go off video and mute for us right now. And we'll have you come back in just a bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And the floor is yours, Marcy. You can go uh, ahead and share your organization now. I have your slides on the screen. Uh, well, thank you so much, Allegra. And I just wanted to say hello and uh, thank everybody for taking the time out of their very busy days um, to be a part of this panel today. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to introduce uh, myself and talk a little bit about our program and our services and what we can offer uh, to seniors who are aging in their own homes. And we can go ahead and flip the slides there, Allegra. Thank you, perfect. So just a little overview about Cherry Blossom PACE. Um, so PACE stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. Um, this is a nationwide program. Uh, it's been around for about 50 years started in the early 1970s in the state of California. And we're very fortunate that the idea of PACE and the model of PACE is being um, really, it's there's a lot of focus on the PACE organization. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is, but I guess I just want to let everybody know there's, there's so many PACE organizations across the nation. Um, and the reason why um, I'm hoping to share some light on our organization is because we are the highest level of care. Um, we provide skilled care in the home, and our goal is to help our seniors who we um, endearingly call participants. So our job is to help seniors age in their own homes, maintain their independence and their health, but also 
while being safe in their own homes, all while working from a very preventative approach to care. So we work very, very hard on preventing hospitalizations, um, accidents, um, ER visits, everything that we do is from a very preventative perspective. Um, and it's a holistic approach to care, meaning that we provide all of the services that we're gonna chat with you about on our next slide under one umbrella. Um, so it's coordinated care. And this is just a super quick slide, not gonna spend a ton of time there. Um, Cherry Blossom Pace is a part of the One Senior Care um, family. And we've been operating in Pennsylvania uh, for about, oh my goodness, since 2006. Cherry Blossom Pace um, is our most urban area and we've been operating here since 2022. And then 2024, we're opening in Eastern Kentucky with, uh, with two pay centers. We can go ahead and move ahead. Thank you. Um, so this slide is where I wanted to spend a little bit of time. Um, so when we talk a little bit about um, seniors that are experiencing and managing symptoms of dementia and caregivers are really struggling and we're hoping to support uh, caregivers and seniors. These are some of the different things um, that we can offer. So we provide medication management and that can really look like a, lots of different things. So this could be um, pre-filled pre medication packs. This could be um, it's daily medication management if needed with the help of um, your medical team, which is a part of our Cherry Blossom Pace um, model of care. This can be medication wheels, medication reminders, um, caregiver support, and we'll talk a little bit about the day center, but we have an entire team of 12 different medical professionals ranging from <clears throat> a social worker, physical therapist, occupational therapist, a recreational therapist, a registered dietitian, home care coordinator. Um, everybody sits around the table every single day and works towards making sure all of our participants are safe in their homes. Um, we also have an opportunity to provide respite care. Um, so in the event that um, our seniors um, and their families, let's say the families are going away and um, the senior is not able to um, go along with them, then we can offer um, some respite support as well to make sure that your loved one is safe and sound while you're away. Um, socialization and cognitive activities. So we do these in our center, um, but then also in the home. And again, that's just super important as you heard previously about keeping that cognitive stimulation and, and challenging the cognitions. Um, so everything, all the activities that we provide in our center, um, there's a big focus there. Talked about our day center. So we have socialization activities. Nobody stays with us. Um, we're open Monday through Friday from eight until five, and we have socialization. Our clinic is right on site. Our folks can get their labs and have their nurses and their therapists and everything right on site there, um, can do wellness and their therapy, all kinds of really great stuff. One other thing that we provide is through the door transportation. So we have our own fleet of vehicles and for our folks that need that support, getting ready for the day before they go out to their medical appointments, we truly do go in pick our folks up, make sure they get back home safely. So it's truly through the door. A um, couple of other things to highlight, 24 seven medical on call. So our team is on call. The team that takes care of our seniors is on call 24 seven for anything that um, families or caregivers may need help with. And then also it's full coverage for primary care, medical specialists, emergencies, and also hospitalization coverage. Um, just wanna highlight too, it's also skilled therapy for our, so our folks that need that. So PT, OT, speech, we also have wellness um, in the center and in the homes. And a couple of other things just to mention, we're here to lift up our families and all of you as caregivers to help coordinate care, schedule appointments, make sure that that follow-up is happening for your loved ones after an appointment. We know how overwhelming it might be after a doctor's appointment. We help with all of that. So if there's an order, for oxygen or supplies or medication, our entire team helps coordinate that um, if that's something that you would like to utilize. And then also medical supplies, medication, everything's covered 100% prescribed and over the counter. And along with vision, dental, and also hearing aids and all that good stuff that comes along with those. And we'll go to the next one. And this may be my last slide, I believe. 
This is the PACE eligibility criteria. Um, so folks in our program are 55 years of age or older. They are deemed eligible for long-term care, um, and then they have to reside in one of our service areas or in a PACE service area. And lastly, they have to be able to and willing to be cared for safely in their home and community setting. I think that might be my last one, Allegra. Let's take a peek. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, can I now have Melissa uh, from Insight Memory Care come and join us and share about your organization? Thank you, Allegra. So I'm the Director of Education and Support at Insight Memory Care Center. Go ahead and flip to the next slide. Um, our need in the community had doubled doubles about every 20 years. So there's 46.8 million people worldwide living with dementia. One in nine, age 65 and older, have Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's is the um, fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. in the age group. And 71,500 with dementia in Northern Virginia. That's estimated to increase about 27% in 2025. And we're actually finding some of those numbers are off. Um, VCU has been doing a great new report to yourself, report yourself, uh, your diagnosis. And we're finding the numbers are off from what we have in other data. So it'll be interesting to see what that actually looks like once we or collect more. Uh, next slide. Um, the need is growing. So in 1984, Insight Memory Care Center was established by Lynn Noyes Simon with um, three participants. And um, today, IMCC is still the only dementia-specific day center in Northern Virginia. So you do have to have a diagnosis of dementia um, to come to Insight. Um, our mission is to provide specialized care, support, and education for individuals in all stages of memory or cognitive impairment, their care partners, and the community. And our vision is a community where those living with memory care or cognitive impairment and their care partners can achieve the highest quality of life. Um, so our values we focus on, we value the person-centered care, we value building connection, and we value creativity in all that we do. Um, so to give you a little back history, we started, it'll be 40 years, um, in 2024, in 1984, we were established as a 501c3 in the basement of a church. We outgrew that space, and in 2024, we moved, um, to Lee Highway in Maryfield, which was designed specifically for individuals, um, with memory impairments. 2015, we grew out of that space, and we ended up where we are now in Fairfax at Pender Drive, tripling in size from 5,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet. That averages us about 60 participants in the adult day center every day. Um, and in 2022, we opened our early stage focus center in Sterling, so we now have two locations. Um, and technically, at our Fairfax location, we also have an early stage program. Um, so what I want to highlight off this slide more than anything, um, this is our last year numbers. Um, the average length of stay for our families at Insight is about a year and a half. This provides a better quality of life for both the individual and their family member to be able to stay at home. It delays the move into um, facilities. Um, our youngest participant, um, I believe right now is 54. Um, and there's just one number, this is just one number in our, our day center um, with 4,163. But if you look at all the programs we provide across the board from education to reconnections, our early stage program, we're servicing 1,200 people a year. Um, and in one year, we had a 12% increase um, in services. Next slide. So this is just to show you, you know, we don't just bring care, we have our early stage programs. But we also have our day center. Um, we have three levels of care that we provide there. Um, we do education with lots of different classes, community workshops, and professional training. Um, we have a published book called Caregiving at a Glance. It's in all your local libraries. Um, along with you can purchase it off of Amazon, or you can contact us on our website and get a free copy. Um, and then we do supports. We have support groups. We have free consultations. We do free memory screenings. We have memory cafes that are growing at every day. <laughs> I believe we have seven or eight now. Um, so you can look on our website for that as well. Um, go ahead and next slide. So when you look at early stage a little more in depth, we have a mind and body workshop where couples come together. So that's the primary caregiver and the individual with the diagnosis. A four-week session, usually in the evenings, we do a group activity, have dinner, and then we separate the individual with the diagnosis 
and the caregiver so that we can do some education with the caregiver and let the individual with the diagnosis do something fun and engage with other people um, that are going through the journey. Reconnections is our early stage program. It's just someone who either has MCI or is recently diagnosed um, with dementia. It's offered four days a week in Fairfax, four days a week in Sterling. We also have an online program and we also are doing it one day a week um, at the Alance in Old Town, Alexandria. Um, this allows for peer support and socialization with non-judgment. Um, to give you an example, I had someone who was really hesitant to go and I got her to do a trial day and I saw her a couple days later and she looked at me and she goes, I found my people. And she finally felt comfortable to do something. Um, the other program we have is SHARE, which is really important. It's a five-week session where, with the optional six for a family session where we build a plan with the caregivers and it's an evidence-based practice program. Um, where we look at all their wishes and wants um, that well, they can voice them after their diagnosis. And we put together a plan that's many pages long and lots of education on the diagnosis and how to stay a couple and not just be a patient and a caregiver type of um, relationship. Um, and then they have this plan in place that they can then share with people as things go on and they have resources to reach out to when they need them. Um, instead of having to search through like in Northern Virginia, there's over 500 home health care agencies in the area and caregivers just don't know where to begin with that. Next slide. Um, so care is the mid to late stages. That's our day center. Um, ratio is five to one in our blue room, which is the higher functioning room. Our middle stage room, it's four to one ratio. And in our coral, um, which is late stage, a lot of sensory based programming, it's three to one. We have multilingual staff. We have health monitoring and medication management. Um, we do have PT and OT coming in, a palliative and hospice specialist. We have podiatry coming in. They get two meals and two snacks offered daily. Um, we just, again, got our three-year license, Virginia Department of Health, um, deficient free. Again, I think this is our fifth or sixth year or longer than that of being efficient, not having any deficiencies. Um, we do therapeutic recreation. Um, we do lots of research studies. We're actually getting ready to pair with George Mason using an OB system for both early stage and our day center. Um, so we're, you know, have lots of students coming in as well to work with us. Um, next slide. Um, these are just some numbers, 18-month um, average stay, 117 participants last year, 41 were male. Um, our longest stay was seven and a quarter years, so it really depends on their diagnosis. Um, reconnections, 39 participants, um, and then five participants um, have attended since the beginning of us doing that. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so highlight the you know, average length of stay is about a year and a half. This provides a better quality of life for the individual and their family to be able to live at home. It also delays a move into a community. Um, and these are just our numbers for our day center again. Um, so, you know, just some of the satisfaction, 94% agree that uh, more time they have to do work, um, get things done because someone's with us and they know that they're safe. Um, I'm going to the next slide and skip to the next one as well. I didn't realize there was a double in there. Ah, education department. So every month we do a care partner education class, the second Wednesday of every month from 1 to 2.30. We are doing them hybrid. Um, we switched to that after COVID. Community workshops were all over at libraries, community centers, senior centers. Um, we'll do workshops with face-based communities, memory screenings at the Wellness Center for Older Adults um, off of Olney Lane. Um, we do professional trainings with communities, um, government agencies. And then um, our last piece in the caregiving at a glance fingertip guide um, book that I had mentioned. We also do a five-week class with that, that we bring in professionals to talk about each chapter as well. Um, I've had, I had one family member say she keeps it on her nightstand and as her husband goes through different stages of the journey, she refers back to it. Um, so it's not a one-time read. Um, it really has been helping her through all the different steps. Um, next page, slide. And you can skip to the next one as well. Um, and then support. Um, we do this by providing support groups. Um, in the past year and a half, we've gone from six to 22 support groups um, and grown quite a bit. Um, we do free consultations so they can give a call and we can talk to them about anything. We've had questions from they've fallen in there at the hospital. 
and they want to discharge them. We don't know where to send them to my husband's incontinent. He won't wear it depends. What do I do? We've had all the questions. There's nothing that's a bad question. We're more than happy to answer if you need to get a home health care agency in and you want some advice on which one to pick. We're happy to help with that. Um, we do memory screenings free, confidential. Um, we do them face to face, not virtually. Um, and I'm every month at the Wellness Center for Older Adults um, off of All Knee. Um, I also do go to some other low income communities as well, but those are private ones. And then if for some reason you can't get to those, and we need to do it one on one at Insight. Um, we can look at my schedule and make that happen. And the other thing we have is memory cafes. Um, we partner both doing it at our centers, but at other senior communities and other locations. Um, so we're all over Fairfax um, and Loudoun County doing those. Um, and we've gone from two to, I believe, eight now of those. Um, and so we're, you know, trying to spread it out more. We did just start a primary progressive aphasia support group at the Kensington Reston. So we are finding a lot of people um, are now facing that going to some memory cafes, their loved one can't hold a conversation and what do they do to be able to get that support? So we've brought that into the mix. Um, next slide. And you can, um, so how can you, oh, <laughs> how can you help uh, volunteer, donate, um, attend a class, sign up for our newsletter? We have lots of great resources on our website from webinars. We just had Dr. Turner talk about the new um, Alzheimer's Med two days ago and the webinar is already up. We have helpful tip guides that you can bring up as well and plenty of blogs, um, but feel free to browse our, our website. But if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me as well. That should be it, Allegra. I know there's a couple more, but we don't have to. No problem. Thank you so much, Melissa. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I can, can Leora come and join us now? And we're going to learn a little bit more about the, the RAF program. And Leora, I'm just pulling it up. Just give me one moment. But if, Leora, if you want to go. That's ahead. okay. I can begin introducing yeah, myself. Just, but, Hi, please. I'm Leora Raskis. Um, I'm a dementia specialist with the RAF Dementia Support Program. Um, we are funded by the, we are a project of the Regional Projects Office, which is funded by the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, uh, otherwise known as DBHDS. Leora, I'm going to have you keep going uh, and just share, and I'm going to be pulling up your PowerPoint. Just give me one second. I got it here. There we go. Okay. It's up, Leora. That's exactly the slide I was looking at. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Maryland. I am an activity director certified from the National Certification Council for Activity Professionals. I worked in recreation and independent living and memory care uh, before prior to this. And in my free time, you can find me probably um, doing yoga or hiking. Um, so that's just a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. Flip. Okay. So I don't think I need to tell the audience what the need is. I think we've heard plenty of that today. Um, I did want to highlight that for um, the adults who are hospitalized at a state psychiatric hospital, for people who have dementia, their stay is actually three and a half times longer. Their average length of stay is 229 days. Um, so that's just uh, telling how, um, where are members of our community going and, um, emphasizing the importance of keeping loved ones at home and strategizing with families. Flip. So what the RAF Dementia Support Program does is we provide education, training, and resource coordination. We were launched in January, 2023, so we just launched this year. Uh, we are free for all families who qualify, um, and we support um, individuals living with dementia in their homes and their caregivers. And we focus on building caregiver resilience and reducing stress and providing education and support to families. And we are short term. We work with families for approximately eight weeks. So a little bit more about our services. We help identify challenging behaviors or other areas of concern. Um, for example, um, 
some of these behaviors might include um, collecting or hoarding, anxiety, shadowing, scams and financial exploitation, verbal and physical aggression, calling 911 on a caregiver, or a family who's unable to maintain um, in-home nurses or aides due to specific behaviors. Um, so that's what we will focus on. And then we provide individualized education and training on topics such as uh, we'll provide an overview of dementia, so the different types of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body, frontal temporal lobe dementia. Um, we'll provide communication skills. So sometimes it's just a little bit of change in communication that can go a long way. And we'll provide um, we'll provide education on safety, both um, both physical safety and financial safety. And we'll also work with families who are. Um, experiencing wandering and other challenging behaviors and help make their home environment um, more suitable uh, for their loved one and reduce reduce their concerns. Um, we connect people, we connect our clients to resources and services, so both county resources and private resource and nonprofits. Um, we've connected a lot of our clients with both Insight and the county, uh, the Fairfax County services as well. Um, we focus on non-pharmacological interventions. So when we, the first line approach is always supposed to be a non-pharmacological um, intervention if possible. So we will speak to the families and as other people have said, boredom is a very big issue. So we will help um, give them ideas of meaningful activities and things to do with their loved one. Um, we will help make suggestions about music and other things like that um, so that their loved one can be in the home or at a day program um, enjoying uh, enjoying themselves and feeling uh, busy. And lastly, we'll do we do future planning. So all of us on the team, there are three dementia specialists. We are all advanced directive facilitators. Um, so we can come to the home and for those who are early on in the disease and those caregivers who want these advanced directives, we're happy to facilitate that. Flip. Eligibility for our program. So we're in Northern Virginia. So any resident of the city of Alexandria, Arlington County, Fairfax, Falls Church, Loudoun, or Prince William counties is eligible for our program if they are 55 years old and have a diagnosis of dementia or are exhibiting symptoms of dementia. Um, and they have to be living in their, their community, in their homes, or in the homes of family members. Um, we will take solo, solo agers on a case-by-case -case basis. So when you go sign up for our program, one of the things you'll notice is, is that there are actually two RAF dementia pro RAF programs. So the first RAF program was actually established in 2008, and it is the RAF clinical program. And that is the RAF Regional Older Adults Facility Mental Health Support Team. Um, and their work, they work with psychiatric hospitals to help discharge uh, people to long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes or assisted living. Um, to kind of break that cycle of people entering, leaving psychiatric hospitals, going to long-term care, then going back into the psychiatric hospitals. So that team is a clinical team and it, died, it was launched in 2008. Um, our team, the RAF Dementia Program, was just launched this year, RAF Dementia Support Program, and we provide education, training, and resource coordination to caregivers living in the community. Um, I like to say that we are helping caregivers stay afloat, thanks to the name RAFT, although I will say that the original RAFT name actually stood for Regional Older Adults Facility Mental Health Support Team. Flip. Oh, perfect. Okay. Anyone can make a referral. So um, go online. Look at the RAF, northernvirginia.org. We are the RAF Dementia Support Program. Our referral uh, forms are online. Um, or contact Sydney Plinkus, who's our outreach director. Um, I am currently uh, filling in for her today. Um, so her email address is, is, on, is on the screen. And uh, feel free. Some people feel more comfortable filling out the form online. Some people prefer uh, to make a phone call, uh, whatever, whatever works. And um, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Leora. Um, so I am now, we're going to start our conversation and I'm just going to go ahead and all the panelists can join me on camera, okay? Um, and uh, if uh, if you could stay muted until I'm asking your question. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
So uh, Dr. Burris, I am going to start with you. Um, what I would like to know is uh, there have been um, several studies right, that are showing how the influence of daycare centers are designed for people who are living with dementia, it has a positive impact on their families. So my question for you, Dr. Burris, is for some family caregivers, uh, a potential barrier, I, I apologize, Dr. Burris, this was not your question. This is going to Marcy, actually, <laughs> I apologize, I'm throwing you off here. So Marcy, my question for you is, a potential barrier to access respite services could be the lack of trust, um, leaving your loved one with, with someone you don't know. Um, so how does PACE build trust with potential family caregivers who are looking for programs? Well, I would have to start way at the beginning. So that's a, that's a, um, a really great question. I appreciate that. Um, from the beginning, so from the very moment that a senior or a caregiver raises their hand and shows um, interest in our PACE program. <clears throat> we work hand in hand from that very moment. So we involve the caregivers, any friends or other support providers to that senior and the senior themselves in the intake process. So um, oftentimes we have lots of family at the first intake visit, which is very um, educational. <clears throat> we take time to answer any questions that they have. And I think we where we set ourselves aside is we become family. And I think that's very evident when I walk into a center and everybody's like giving hugs and I love you. And you know uh, the testimonies that we receive from caregivers and from um, our participants is, you know, pace saved my life and um, facilitating that in care planning. So we have individual daily care planning every day as a morning meeting for our participants. And um, we have family conferences that we promote and facilitate. Families are welcome anytime to come to the center and visit. So we really prompt that engagement. So I think coming back to the trust, you know, I think we educate and we remind our seniors and caregivers, you know, there's a lot of scammers out there and folks are gonna call you. And so that's a barrier. So we understand that the trust we work on right from the beginning and we recognize that sometimes folks with all of these great services we're talking about today, what's the catch? This is too good to be true. And I think for all of us, it's building that rapport right from the beginning, being available, being prompt, um, and just really individualizing uh, the care and the communication. Um, so I think it's just really developing the rapport and becoming family. Thank you so much for that. Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Burris, I'm coming back to you now. <laughs> so as I was saying before, um, what I'm interested in knowing is how does attending an adult day health center impact the overall wellness for the family caregiver? Okay. So the four big benefits that we have, um, that we speak of with adult day um, is preserving independence, um, ADAC offers a chance for people with dementia or other disabilities to get out of the house and be on their own in a safe environment. They enjoy control over activities that they partake in, increasing their self-esteem and sense of well-being. It can also help maintain positive relationships between the person and the caregiver. Relationships can often become strained due to stress and agitation on both sides. When you leave your loved one in an adult health center care, that leaves some alone time for you. You can do some errands, you can see a friend for coffee without worrying about him or her for a few hours. Falls, reducing falls is the second, is, is the second benefit. You may already know that your loved one participates in physical and occupational therapy each day they attend the center. What you might not know is that these exercises, while good for the body, mind, and circulatory system, also help maintain core strength, balance, and prevent falls. As caregivers, you know these are big benefits. Preventing a fall and staying out of the emergency room are top priorities as they can be life and death situations. Our third benefit is socialization. While it may seem like individuals care would be a better option for your loved one, he or she might be missing a big part of socializing aspect that ADAC has to offer. At ADAC, people with dementia can socialize with others just like them whether it's through bingo, 
of physical therapy, patients can thrive through emotional connection. Our last benefit is improving overall well-being. Patients who are stimulated during the day sleep better at night and are less likely to have falls at home. And patients who are socialized and enjoy themselves are less likely to be depressed and more likely to eat better. These services and benefits translate into much improved quality for both patients and caregivers. Thank you so much for that response, Dr. Burris. I'm going to now go to, my next question is for Melissa. Uh, Melissa, uh, my question for you uh, is when family caregivers are new to caregiving for a loved one with dementia, how do they know when it's the right time to enroll their loved one in one of your programs um, or when it's not appropriate to enroll them? So the best time is as soon as you learn about us. Um, some people is right away when there's a diagnosis. Sometimes it's a little later on because we don't just do one service. Um, and so, you know, as we say, when you join Insight, you join a family and we do the whole level of care from beginning to end. So we have people um, in the day center that actually are on hospice. Um, so we help through all the pieces. Um, so there's never a, a bad time, um, sooner the better, because the longer you have our support and you can feel like you have that, that family and that quality of life improvement being a part of our programs. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then my, my next question is for Leora. Um, so Leora, when I was reading about the RAF dementia program, I learned about the RAT program. And I thought it was very helpful for not just for caregivers, but for their loved ones with dementia um, and for the caregiving journey in general. Can you explain what is the Wellness Recovery Action Plan and how does it promote caregiver resilience? And Leora, you're muted right now. So we got to, there we go. My apologies. That's okay. The RAT plan was developed actually in 1997. Um, and it was actually started by a group of individuals who were, were living with serious mental illness. They were on a retreat in Vermont. Um, and so the leaders, Mary Ellen Copeland and Jane Winterling, they created this wellness recovery action plan. Um, so when we work with caregivers, it meet, we'll give them a binder the first time we meet them, um, which includes the materials from the wrap and also our cards and um, some basic information that's helpful for them. Um, and then within our wrap, it contains several templates. So for example, it contains a, a template for daily routines because we know that routine is helpful for people living with dementia. It contains a grab and go sheet. So let's say an emergency happens and EMS is there, you can hand off the sheet and it already has all your medications written on there and all your doctors and their phone numbers. Um, so the wrap contains different um, it contains different templates that are helpful for caregivers and it's a living growing document. So one of our caregivers was really concerned that um, he, his spouse, you know, he would die and his spouse would wake up one morning and there'd be no one to take care of them. Um, and, you know, it's a concern that a number of our caregivers have actually raised. And so we added into the wrap, we added a hygiene sheet where they could write down all their hygiene practices. So how they brush their teeth, what music they play when they take a bath, everything kind of so that someone could open the book and start off, you know, and know exactly what they're doing. Um, so as our caregivers give us ideas, we have expanded it. Um, I also, you know, I like to say that um, the RAP stands for Wellness Recovery Action Plan, but we're also providing what we would um, call wraparound services. Um, we're really taking a team approach um, helping the person who is living with dementia and the caregiver, and then helping them tie the different parts of the pieces together, um, what resources they need, how to navigate that process. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about our wrap document. Um, and um, it has been, it, as, as I said, it has been very helpful. And I also think that it gives our, uh, it gives our loved ones, uh, our caregivers and the people living with dementia a sense of autonomy and control over their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I want to thank all our panelists for setting the stage for this discussion. I would like to invite our audience to uh, continue to submit your questions now. Um, please use the Q&A button. Um, and we're going to try to get through all the questions. If we do not get to your question, you do have the contact information for every one of 
our panelists or their organization. So you will get the slides um, and you're going to get the recording. So I just wanted to remind everyone. And if you have a question for a specific panelist, please put their name in, in the Q&A and so we can address that separately. Um, what, uh, let's go ahead and start. Um, Leora, does RAFT serve clients in AL, memory support, or independent living? We serve clients who are living in independent living, because um, technically independent living is still within the community. Uh, we don't serve clients uh, generally within assisted living or memory care. Thank you. Um, Lior, another question. How many patients are in the RAF program? Is there a staff ratio? Average of how long clients are in the program? Is the support only in the home? Sorry, a few questions. <laughs> a lot of questions. Okay. So the answer is that we normally work with families for about eight weeks. Um, and we'll meet with them usually about an hour, usually about every week, but sometimes it's less, sometimes it's every other week. It really depends um, on, on the family. And in terms of our client load, um, the RAF dementia specialists usually have approximately 10 uh, families that they're working with at a time. Um, and that's that's kind of generally been the load, but sometimes the load can thankfully be a little bit less and we have a bit more time. Um, and so that's generally how the program works. So technically there could be up to 30 participants in our program, maybe even a little bit more at a time, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, for Melissa, I'm a Montgomery County um, uh, resident. Am I and my husband eligible for attending the Insight activities in Virginia? Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. We actually have a caregiver that drives his wife from Rockville, Maryland, to participate in our um, reconnections program currently. Um, with helping caregivers, we have actually, we did a tally and found out we're actually reaching 29 different states right now and also some um, different countries, depending on where a caregiver lives. So um, if you want to drive down from programs, it's more than welcome, but tons of our stuff's online and you're more than welcome to join those online programs as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Burris, um, what about a person who has never been a social person? Do you think that the adult day care would still be beneficial? Thank you, Allegra. Yes, I do. We do individualize our programs um, to our participants. Uh, part of the admission assessment um, portion is for the caregivers to provide a social history. It kind of, I tell all caregivers, you know, tell me everything I need to know about your loved ones on paper before I actually see them. And we create based off of the social interaction um, forum and also the assessment, what kind of activities um, is good for that person. We also allow our caregivers 30 days, like when they enroll into the program, it gives us 30 days to spend some time with them, get to know them. We invite caregivers into the center as well to spend four to six hours or even a day with uh, with their loved ones so they can get used to the program and see the programs. We provide a social calendar, a 30-day calendar that tells you every single activity that's happening on that day. If they just want to come two days a week when we have, you know, a singing band program, they can do that. If they want to come for six hours and not eight hours, they are more than welcome to do that as well. So they may not be social, but there's something that we can find that can get them active and also keep them in tune into the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a question for everyone on the call, um, our, the panelists. <laughs> Are there weekend drop-in programs for adults with dementia um, in Fairfax County? So one of your programs, they have a good uh, system Monday through Friday, but it would be helpful to have um, my husband in a program for four to six hours on a Saturday or a Sunday. And I can address that from the PACE perspective, that's okay, Allegra. Absolutely. Um, I think that's great that um, your audience members are bringing that up um, and how we would, what we offer is the PACE program is basically we do provide services on the weekends. And so if that's a need that the family and the caregivers have um, with that senior, then we can provide that um, over the weekend care. Our day center is not open on Saturday and Sunday, um, but we still have those staff that can come into the home. We can still do that wellness, that therapy, um, the socialization. And again, 
um, reinforcing that 24 seven on call. That's our entire medical team that's on call. So if there's something that's needed on the weekend and it's outside of normal business hours, um, that does not, um, that's not a barrier to us providing that weekend care. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, we have also um, tried to bring that to the table because we've had lots of asks that every time we go to offer it, no one signs up or we have like one person sign up. So we'll keep re-approaching it. Um, we've even tried like a couple hours for holiday shopping and things like that. And so we'll keep trying because um, we hear everybody wants it. But when the times that are it's per, you know offered, we don't quite get the response we were expecting. So thank you. And then Marjorie, how about you? How about your center? Adult day, unfortunately, adult day does not offer weekend um, programs. Um, we have talked in the past about possibly having a Saturday and including caregivers, um, but that's just a conversation. It's nothing that's been discussed with the committee or leadership. Um, I would encourage the caregivers to reach out to the senior centers or their local um, senior. Um, community to see if they would offer something on the weekends, but for now in the county, we do not. Okay. And then I know, Leora, yours is a little different. You're going to the home with the caregiver. Uh, do you all do that on the weekends too, but it's not meant to be respite, correct? Um, no. So we we do have a respite offering program um, that is in different stages of, of development that we do offer. Um, but for our caregivers on the weekends, we have not seen a lot of programming um, and we definitely hear a lot of people requesting for it. So uh, if uh, Melissa, you ever get that program going, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we can shoot out an email and uh, make sure that make sure that everyone knows, because it definitely is a whole um, for a lot of our caregivers, the 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 day center is a saving grace in the week, um, but they don't have what to do on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, um, Marcy. Um, can I direct this question to you? Um, my loved one was diagnosed with MCI in 2019, and illness has progressed. I don't want to undermine their own decision making, but things are really not working right now in their life. How do I get them to move more towards uh, support. And if anyone else has anything else to add after Marcy, feel free to jump in. I think that's um, that's a very common barrier. I think probably everybody on the panel um, has worked with families and with seniors who um, one of the biggest barriers that we work really hard to get in front of and prevent is I feel oftentimes when seniors raise their hands or they say, I need help. One of the fears is that somebody's going to think that they can no longer be safe in their homes. And um, so that's something that we work very hard from the beginning. And I think, again, it's, it's really coming back to that, that connection and really meeting every individual where they are and building on that rapport and finding their individual you know, strengths and passions. And also along with that, their fears and their worries. And really, you know, we have a social worker on board and you know, all of our other members, they can come in and really kind of lift up that support system and lift up that senior. And again, it's it's as much time as a senior needs to build that rapport, um, we're there and just being available. But I think also it's important that um, a lot of the programs that we're talking about today, including the PACE program, is we age with our seniors. So <clears throat> when somebody comes into our program initially, they may not need every single level of support that we have to offer. So they age with us. So we work from a very, um, we promote independence. And so they may not need skilled therapy. They may not need wound care. They may not need, um, you know, the, the cognitive social activities um, and that intense daily programming. So I think once we build that rapport and um, with the senior and with the participant, we'll find that they become even more comfortable and willing to um, accept the help that we're offering. Um, so I think it just starts with the report. And I think everybody else, I can hear Melissa is like ready to answer that too. Yeah, I think the other piece too to acknowledge though is that some people may have agnosia, which means they may not recognize that they have this diagnosis and you may never get beyond that issue. Um, and so you're just going to have to take the bull by the horns and just kind of do things and getting creative. You know, I've had some people 
um, get a money manager where they're doing finances with the person, but they're not actually doing the finances and they're doing it behind the scenes to make sure it's done correctly and things like that. So they still feel independent and they, they're still doing everything, but they're actually not. And so sometimes you get really creative with that because um, you just may never get beyond that point with some people. I think for um, adult day, um, when we when we come across some of care, caregivers or neighbors or um you know, children and friends of communities that email us or call us and present that situation. I always tell them to, if they don't have dementia or Alzheimer's, I direct them to the senior center. I, you know, I have them come to one of the centers that have a senior center or direct them there and then have them give them a tour. Um, at adult day, we also allow them to come and spend the day with us. Um, you can come, bring your loved ones with you. We'll sit down and tell you about the process. There's nothing, you know, there's no cost to coming and spending the day with us. Um, have them come a couple times, you know, you know, maybe once a week until they can make up their mind and decide what they want to do. Um, but a lot of them really are not sure about it. They look at it as, you know, a senior, you know, long-term care, the end of the road. And all of our centers are are different, and we 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 have participants that have Alzheimer's and dementia, but we also have some high functioning participants, and we have a ton of programs and recreational activities that I think would benefit them. So I always like to bring them into the setting, and have them see what's happening. Um, we provide breakfast, lunch, and a snack. So if you just want to come and spend a day or spend a couple of days before you make up your mind, um, I tell them to bring them, and they are more than welcome to stay with them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, Leora, a question came in. Is the wrap document, a, um, a as discussed, is it available online? It sounds like a great idea. I don't know if it's available online. Um, I Please check out our website. I know that Sydney's put a bunch of things up. If it's not available online, my email is in the chat and I'm happy to send you the PDF. You're muted. Allegro, you're muted. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Here I am talking. Um, what resources can you recommend for families of loved ones who are in late stages of dementia? Caring for mom has become very overwhelming for dad and I, but she is not qualified for Medicaid and they cannot afford a skilled nursing facility. Um, so if any of the panelists can speak to that, um, so with Insight, we can help you look at different resources. We do have a financial assistance program at Insight, which I did not mention that people can qualify for as well. So we have people that are paying as little as, you know, like $20 a day for a program, depending on if they qualify. So that's available in that. And you can come to us for eight and a half hours a day, five days a week, which would take a lot of that weight off as long as they, um, the, the only time we can't take someone is when, you know, they're um got a catheter that they can't self take care of things like that um but you know we'll even do showers and stuff at insight as well so we can take care of that if those are some of your burdens um with those pieces um and, you know we can help find resources out there that are low income because there are lots of great resources out there people just don't know about them because there's so many and i think i would just like to add um we're an alternative to nursing home care in the home and you know there are going to be opportunities and times where somebody needs you know, that 24 seven care of a nursing home, but I would just encourage everybody to know um, what the private pay portion is for services. Um, we do have a number of folks who privately pay um, each month. It's one premium payment with no co-pays, no deductibles, it's hundred percent coverage um, for the approved services. So I would just encourage, um, you know, a lot of folks to, to look at those individual amounts and, and not um, automatically disqualify maybe a program that might be needed without having that conversation. At ADHD, we do offer respite as well. We do have a respite program um, if you qualify. Um, if you don't qualify for Medicaid, we could also find out why you don't qualify for Medicaid and also help you with that financial assistance. Our fee scale starts from $14 a day and the highest that you pay to attend a adult day in, in the county is $109 a day. We also offer uh, Fast Tran that will do round trip 
um, door to door for $2.50 a day. Um, depending on the stage or what stage of the dementia or Alzheimer's that your loved one might have, I would recommend you calling the center and having one of these um, center nurse coordinators do an assessment so they can decide exactly what stage so we can see if the program is a good fit or not. Thank you. And just Leora. Oh, I was just going to echo what, what everyone else was saying. Um, when we see clients in that situation, um, we off, we work in five different counties, so we will often uh, see what the county resources are that are available, and then there may be other um, outside resources like nonprofits, like the Shepherd Center or something like that, that can help with some of the other costs to balance things out. Um, so that's definitely a resource we looked into. Um, I'm currently working with a client um, and her medications cost a lot of money. So we have been looking into that as a way to kind of reduce some of the other costs so that they can afford services for their loved one. Great. Um, and I did want to let the audience know it is three o'clock. We are at our hour. We're going to stay on an extra five minutes. We'll get through a few more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, a question that came in was, you know, if if you all serve um, caregivers who loved ones don't live in this state. Um, so a long distance caregiver who lives in another state, can you still provide services? And Melissa, I know that you can. You want to yes. share? <laughs> yeah, we. I, I have a son. I I help with his parents, and he's in China. So I mean, we we help anyone. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. There's no limit on where you're located for us. Thank you, Marjorie. You're muted. <laughs> yes, same for ADHD. We have caregivers that um, live in other countries, and we do care conferences on um, virtually if we have to, um, and we prepare. Um, all of the paperwork and also do the assessment with the caregiver um, at the, with the with the participant at the site. So you don't if the caregiver doesn't live there, we still communicate and we are still able to have interdisciplinary meetings with the caregiver virtually just to keep them involved and in tune with what's going on with the participant. Thank you, thank you. And then, Lior, do you do any long distance caregiving? Yeah, we we do. Um, I have spoken with caregivers around the world. Um, we do it more on a case-by-case -case basis. So if the victim individual is solo aging and they're not safe in their home, that's another concern. Um, but if the individual has, you know, is safe in their home and has has a team on the ground, we'll also speak to their loved ones wherever they are in the world. Thank you so much. Um, if someone has a friend who is, they think in the very early stages of something, and there's no relative or siblings that live out of state, how does the friend approach them about seeing a doctor? Uh, does anyone have a thought about that? Um, I think one of the segues, um, I had talked to a bunch of practitioners actually last week when I was in Richmond with VDH. We find the memory screening is a really good tool for that. So going to a wellness fair or a scheduled memory screening and the friend gets one and the person they're thinking of gets one. And then that's a segue for us to open the door for them to say, you know what, this is a score. And I think it'd really help you to talk to your doctor a little further about this. Um, and we found that most people that come to those screenings um, throughout the state, about 90% of them already know there's something going on. They just needed that extra, yep, maybe you should take the next step and knowing that it's okay to do that. Um, and so I found that that's a really helpful tool. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, and what I, I know we're, we're getting really close to our, to our time here. So ladies, I want to end with, um, I'm going to ask everyone the same question. And uh, so my question for you all, uh, just to, to start this off is that there has been a qualitative study showing findings that, um, if you go to a, um, a day program, you could postpone moving into a facility. Why is that? Why do you believe that so? Um, I'll take that one so I can um, let everybody um, have a few moments. I think it's just, it's, it's the socialization. It's really having everything surrounding you. It's the familiarity. It's the relationships. It's that safety and security. Like for instance, our day centers are, are secure and there's lots of supervision and there's lots of individualization. So I think it's just really stimulating the social, the cognitive, being available, being consistent. And um, I will stop there. <laughs>
thing. Adult, I would say the adult daycare offers a win-win situation for everyone in the family. Not only the client or member who attends the program, but also for the family member who has primary responsibility as a caregiver. Um, it provides a much needed respite for the caregiver, affording a break from the physical demands and stress of providing round the clock care and the participation in adult day care activities may even enhance or maintain your level of independence, keeping your caregivers living at home longer by relieving caregiver fatigue and delaying uh, the escalation of dependence. Yes, yeah, so with our, sorry, Lori. No, Lori. go for it. Um, on our annual survey, we had 79% of our families say that it either delayed or it stopped an admission from a memory care. Um, and if you look back on the studies through COVID, um, you saw that it went up um, a good 15 to 20% of people not socializing that declined faster. And so I really think, you know, just on the socialization piece, but also getting that medical care that you may not think about you know, not missing a medication because there's a nurse watching, all, all those pieces come together that provide, you know, getting more food versus using the microwave or, you know, doing a, a healthier meal just allows them to have that, that hold all those domains of care met so that they can um, have the good care that they need to keep being successful and have that quality of life. Yes. And the one thing I wanted to add on to that is that for some people, they never end up in a facility. Mm -hmm. uh, about two thirds of people uh, living with dementia at some point do, but there are others who, who don't. Um, and that's, you know, a solo aging and a choice that our families make um, that we respect. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to all our panelists. This has been great, valuable information. I really appreciate your time today. And I hope that the audience found this conversation helpful and that you got to learn more about the programs. I wanted to let everyone know that our next uh, Dementia Caregiver Series will be on Wednesday, October 11th from 12 to 1.15, and we will be presenting a dementia-friendly information session on that day. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone to please partake in our survey. Um, if you have comments uh, for our panelists, you can put that in our survey and I will share those with them. Um, and we really just wanna know what other topics you're interested in uh, for your caregiving journey. And uh, with that, I'm going to let everyone go. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you again so much for being with us today. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.